الرحمن علم القرآن خلق الإنسان علمه البيان الشمس والقمر بحسبان والنجم والشجر يسجدان Assalamu alaikum my friends. Welcome to another episode of the Revelation Experience. I'm Miraj Mohideen. Today we're going to be talking about our continuation of the early Meccan surahs, picking up with Surah Al-Fil. Al-Fil means the elephant. And this surah takes us back to an event that happened at the year of the Prophet's birth, peace be upon him, we believe in roughly 570 common era. So this is referring to an event that happened at least 40 years ago. Um, and now we talked about this in detail in, I believe, episode number 10, when we're talking about Abraha's attack on Mecca. And so what I'm going to do, actually, is I'm actually going to kind of edit in uh, parts of that uh, talk, because it really I went through it in detail talking about Surah Al-Fil. But just as a quick recap, in that period of time, in those lectures, we were doing the prologue, talking about the empires around Arabia, talking about the religions around Arabia. And we had left off talking about the Himyarite kingdom kingdom in Yemen. And remember I had told you the story of Surat al-Buruj where the uh, Persians had come in, had conquered Yemen, kicked the Abyssinians out. There was a king there by the name of Yusuf Dunawaz who forced all the Christians to convert to Judaism. And when they refused, he dug a huge pit and threw the Christians in and burned them. And this was mentioned in Surat al-Buruj, many scholars believe. Then we talked about how the Abyssinians came back and kicked them out of Yemen, the Persians, and they established rule in this area of Southern Arabian Peninsula. And the general who was responsible for this ultimately rose to power as the governor of Yemen, right? The governor from the Abyssinian Empire, and that governor's name was Abraha. So shortly after Abraha assumed control, he erected a really big cathedral in the city of Sana'a, and he called it Yemeni al Kaaba which means basically like the Yemeni Kaaba, you know? So he's basically saying, look, we can have a big uh, place, a big hub, commercial center, a big religious center that can compete with the Kaaba in Mecca. So he has this ambitious plan to lure pilgrims away from Mecca and be like, hey, why would you go there? I just built a bigger airport here. Let's make this the commercial hub. Let's have everyone flying in and out of this center and let's make this a very powerful empire is basically what he's saying. Well, this doesn't sit well with the Meccans. The Meccans are feeling threatened by this. Who is this guy to start luring you know, uh, commerce and business and pilgrims away from us? And so there is a man from that area, not from Mecca, but from a tribe of Bani Kanana, which is just south of Mecca. And he takes it on himself to go down to this cathedral that's being built, Abraha's Cathedral, and he um, defaces the cathedral. In some narration, it says that he, you know, smeared feces on the cathedral or something ridiculous like that, but he defaces the cathedral. This obviously angers Abraha. Like, who are these, you know, Bedouin Arabs to come in? I'm a general with this empire behind me. Who are these people to come in? and insult me like this. And so what he does is he swiftly assembles 60,000 soldiers led by several elephants and he sets out to destroy the Kaaba in Mecca. Okay, so these are African elephants that they have imported to Yemen. The Arabs haven't really seen these elephants before. This is like a whole new type of warfare to them. And so Abraha leads this charge. So Abraha travels north as he approaches and you can see the map of Abraha's march north on page 72, uh, figure P18. And in the year 570, very important year, because what else happened in 570? The birth of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. That same year, Abraha leads these 60,000 troops and roughly nine to 13 elephants north to try to um, destroy the Kaaba. So he's saying, if you defiled my cathedral, I'm just gonna destroy yours. He goes and he stops at Taif first, because remember Taif was east of uh, uh, Mecca, and so he, on his way, he stops by at Taif. Now when he stops there, the people of Taif, the Bani Taqif, they feared that maybe Abra has come to destroy their 
uh, temple. And so they're nervous about that. And they're saying, no, 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 no. And they're like, you know, imagine they're just like desperately pointing to the West and be like, uh, I think you mean to go a little bit West. And so they redirect Abraha towards Mecca. Now, two miles out of the city, Abraha's army stops at a place called Muhammad. They plunder the area. They steal 200 camels belonging to the Quraysh because, you know, the Quraysh had camels on the outskirts. They have, you know, herds and, you know, like ranches, the ranchers, and they're kind of herding their camels out in the outskirts of Mecca. Well, two miles out, Abraha sees 200 camels and he steals them all. Now, before attacking Mecca, Abraha requests to speak to the leader of the Quraysh. Now, who was the leader of the Quraysh? Now, this is where it gets, you know, kind of, Interesting. The Quraysh have been split and split and split again. Remember we talked about the Quraysh. They were the Quraysh of the hollow and the Quraysh of the outskirts. The Quraysh of the hollow further subdivided into the scented ones and the confederates. So who is a leader of the Quraysh? Well, it's very important. You know, when we look at the politics of Mecca and the politics of the Quraysh, the most powerful clans were not Bani Hashem, the clan of the Prophet. The most powerful clans were the clans of Mahzum and the clans of Abd shams Okay? They were economically the most powerful. The clan of Hashem was not necessarily the most powerful. That being said, Abd al-Muttalib, in many ways, was the head of the Banu Hashem. And so even though he might not be the most powerful politically, or economically, he is in many ways the keeper of the the well of Zamzam, and he is the one who is charged with the responsibility of feeding the pilgrims. So he is a very notable person. Is he the king of the Quraysh? I think it's pretty hard to say that when you actually look at what was happening in Mecca at the time. But in many ways, he is a representative of the Quraysh. Now, Abd al-Muttalib, remember that young boy named Sheba who grew up to be this man, this chief, Abd al-Muttalib, he goes to meet with Abraha. When Abraha meets Abdul Muttalib, he's fairly impressed by this man. And he is so impressed that he says that he will grant him one favor before he destroys the Kaaba. And Abdul Muttalib famously asks him to just return the camels that he stole. And he, compl- and he continues by saying that as for the imminent destruction of the Kaaba, he says, I am the Lord of the camels. And the temple likewise has a Lord who will defend it. So what Abdul Muttalib is telling Abraha is like, look, I'm only responsible for my camels. My Lord is responsible for his house. So I can't defend that. Now, Abraha is surprised by this because, you know, he might not be understanding the thinking that Abdul Muttalib has. And he decides ultimately to resume his march into Mecca and to completely destroy the Kaaba, to overrun it with the elephants and so forth. However, as he nears the Kaaba, the sky starts to turn dark and the lead elephant Mahmud refuses to go any farther. And we see Allah saying, haven't you seen how your Lord dealt with the army of the elephant? ألم تر كيف فعل ربك بأصحاب الفيل Now what was holding back the elephant despite Abraha's every desire to push it forward? Well, we will see many years later that when the Prophet Muhammad peace upon him is making the march to Mecca at Hudaybiyah, his camel stops. And he says in a narration that the same one who is holding his camel back is the one who held back the Abraha's elephant during the siege on Mecca. So the elephant refuses to budge any further. And in one narration that describes the scene, it says, Suddenly it was too late. The western sky grew black and a strange sound was heard. Its volume increased as a great wave of darkness swept upon them from every direction of the sea and the air above their heads as high as they could see. It was full of birds. Survivors said that they flew with a flight like that of swifts and each bird had three pebbles the size of dried peas, one in its beak and one between the claws of each foot. They swooped to and fro over the ranks, pelting as they swooped, and the pebbles were so hard and launched with such velocity that they pierced even coats of mail. So, Abraha's army is completely decimated, and the few remaining survivors flee back to Yemen. How do we know that this happened? Well, we have two reasons how we know this happened. First, of course, and the most powerful, is we have Surat al-Fil. Surat al-Fil Feel is the word for elephant. 
And we see Allah saying, Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi fil. Haven't you seen how your Lord dealt with the army of the elephant? Didn't he foil their evil plans? He let loose upon them a horde of flyers, which struck them down with stones smacked, leaving their ranks like barren fields harvested and raised. ألم تر كيف فعل ربك بأصحاب الفيل ألم يجعل كيدهم في تضليل وأرسل عليهم طيرا أبابيل ترميهم بحجارة من سجيل فجعلهم كعصف مأكول so the surah, which is an early Meccan surah, which was revealed at least 40 years after the event. Remember, this happened during the birth of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And we know that he got his first revelation when he was 40. So this surah had to have been revealed at least 40 years after this event of uh, Abraha's army attempting to invade Mecca. It's saying, the tone of the surah is saying, haven't you seen how your Lord dealt with the army of the elephant? Meaning that everyone knew that this happened. Okay, so we know that this happened, A, because it is mentioned in the Qur'an very clearly. We also know that it happened because everyone knew it happened. There was no question of like, oh, this was a, it wasn't like a UFO sighting. Everyone knew that this happened. That's called mutawatir in the sense that everyone knows. Everyone's reporting this. It's like a known fact. Just like today, everyone knows uh, that a world event happened because everyone witnessed it. You couldn't make everyone, uh, you couldn't get everyone complicit in a lie. So everyone knew that this happened. And everyone was aware of this. And the Qur'an is using this example as a warning to the Quraysh. Look, I protected this city from invaders. But Allah is also saying, he's implying, he has a power over all things here. Anything can be raised. Anything that goes against the will of Allah. Finally, in later stories, we also have narrations of survivors of this event who lived in, in Mecca and were witnessed by the companions who saw some of the survivors of this horrible uh, massacre that happened. Now, after Abraha's defeat, the Yemeni Arabs, they were backed by Persian forces. They overthrew the Abyssinian rulers and established a Persian governorship in Yemen. Now, the question is this, what did this event do for the Quraysh? Well, what it did is it showed the rest of the Arabs that there is some kind of divine protection over these people and their sanctuary. These are, in many ways, a chosen people. God, for whatever reason, is choosing this, these Quraysh people, this tribe, as a protected people. And from then on, the Arabs regard the Quraysh as the people of God. There's something special about these, Arab, these Arabs. They're unlike the Lakhmids or the Ghassanids or Bani Taqif or Bani Kinana. There's something special about the Bani Quraysh that God is protecting them for some reason. And they don't know what it is. But from that moment on, after the failed attack of Abraha, the Quraysh have a higher esteem in Arabia than any other tribe. And this level of respect that the Arabs had for the Quraysh, we will see throughout the Sira, and even towards the end of the Sira, we will see that the Quraysh ultimately are the tribe that most of Arabia was willing to follow. And we'll see this even with the Aus and the Khazraj after the succession of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, the companions are trying to figure out who will lead and who will be the first leader after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And they come to realize that it has to be someone of Quraysh. The Arabs will not follow an Ausi or a Khazraji because they don't have the esteem that the Quraysh had developed over these years and years of showing their nobility and then also this event of uh, the year of feel where Allah has chosen the Quraysh. So this idea of the Quraysh as a very special people was a feeling that grew and grew throughout Arabia. So that ends this discussion of Surat al-Feel right here. Um, hopefully uh, that was exciting for you. I love these surahs that draw go back into history and retell stories. I just find them so fascinating and so forth. And we have so many more of those surahs to cover. I'm super excited to jump into all of those with you. So if this was helpful for you, feel free to share, subscribe, like, let me know in the comments what's working for you. And we are wrapping up this 
first section, uh, this first uh, bucket of early Meccan surahs, we have three more surahs to talk about. And these are surahs that probably most of you, these are the first surahs that you probably uh, memorized or learned. Uh, these are uh, Surat Al-Ikhlas, Surat Al-Falaq, and Surat Al-Nas. So can't wait to see you guys in the next episode. I will see you guys soon. Assalamu alaikum. إن الذين قالوا ربنا الله ثم استقاموا فلا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون أولئك أصحاب الجنة خالدين فيها خالدين فيها جزاء بما كانوا يعملون